Thanks. Awesome. Well, I'll try to get through this quickly so you can enjoy the sunshine uh, and, and uh, lunch in Seattle. So, yes. uh, really, there's going to be two parts. The, the first part is I'm going to walk you through how we generated this idea uh, scientifically and, and, uh, and, and why we think it's, it's an attractive idea, and then how we parlayed this in, into doing a very small pilot study uh, in Seattle. And as I mentioned, uh, the, the uh, some of some of the uh, challenges we had in terms of thinking about how to design this study and how to assess outcomes. So I'm going to start with a bit of biology, and I'm just going to describe the HIV reservoir uh, and how it might persist despite the fact that people are on antiretroviral therapy for decades. Uh, then I will come to why we developed this anti-proliferative strategy for decreasing the size of the HIV reservoir, and then finally I'll describe our small study. So. This is the starting point, uh, and I, I always like to remind myself and others that ART is just a phenomenal intervention. It's, it's really a miracle. Uh, and when people are infected with HIV prior to receiving ART, typically they establish a viral load steady state where the virus is constant over weeks and months. Uh, and in the absence of therapy, typically people will progress to AIDS uh, and death. But antiretroviral therapy initiates a very rapid decline in virus. So on the y-axis here, you have the amount of virus in the blood per cc of blood, and then this is over time. And as long as antiretroviral therapy and the right regimen is continued, the virus will remain either undetectable or only detectable at a blip level. And so that's great. And this keeps people alive potentially for decades longer than they would have been without therapy. The problem is, is that even after years and even decades of therapy, if treatment is interrupted, in most people, the virus rebounds. and rebounds fairly rapidly, usually within a time frame of weeks. And all of <coughs> the problems that, that were uh, operant up here are, are once again relevant if ART is not reinitiated. And so why does this occur? Well, it occurs because of the HIV reservoir. And the, the way I think about the HIV reservoir is it's really a needle in a haystack problem. It's actually not very many cells. Uh, if you think about this at the level of the entire body, most estimates, though I don't think there's a perfect estimate, that most people who have chronic, chronically treated, effectively treated uh, HIV have approximately one to 10 million of these cells in their body. Uh, of all of the CD4 T cells floating around in tissue and blood, this is about one in a million, so they're pretty rare. And they're disseminated widely throughout organs in the body, throughout lymph nodes in the body. So it's not like they're all in one place. And so to target them is tricky. Then if you drill down and think about the single cell, what HIV does as a retrovirus is very clever. In an initial stage of its replication process, it integrates into the human chromosome and becomes essentially part of the DNA. In, a latent, in an latently infected cell, that's where the process stops. So the virus does not produce uh, 10,000 copies of itself and go on to infect another cell as it would do in the absence of ART. Rather, it just sort of sits there. And usually, it's just one little molecule of HIV in this incredibly complex cell. And so not a lot of HIV per cell, not a lot of cells in the body, and this cell doesn't appear to be that different from a cell that's uninfected in terms of what it does. It's not expressing a lot of HIV protein. It's not getting targeted by the immune system. And so it really has the ability to survive for a long time. So a really tricky therapeutic target. And this is why uh, researchers trying to, trying to achieve a cure have a, a, an enormous challenge. <clears throat> These are two critically important studies, one from Johns Hopkins, one from uh, uh, the University of North Carolina. And these are measures of people who have been on ART effectively for many, many years, measured over time. And then this is looking at the number of cells that have virus that can replicate in their blood. IUPM means per million. So again, really low numbers of cells. But what both of these investigators noticed is that the number of infected cells, if you don't do anything, if you don't intervene, is very, very stable over time. They estimate a, a half-life of 44 months, and what that means effectively is you could treat somebody for 70 years and their reservoir will still be there and they still may reactivate the virus. So what we would like to do is make this line steeper over time. 
so that the reservoir uh, decays and, and our strategies should affect that. One uh, other point that's important to really understand when considering cure research and considering our study is that the HIV reservoir is challenging to measure. So the easiest way to measure it is just to look at all of the HIV DNA present in a sample. This is uh, the cheapest way for a lab to do this, uh, and you get the highest numbers. And the nice thing about that is that you can measure it very effectively and reproducibly. The problem is, is that when HIV replicates itself, the enzyme that replicates the virus produces lots and lots of errors in the virus. And most of those errors actually kill the virus. It, make, it makes it not replication competent. So about 99 or even 99.9% .9 of this virus is not relevant. It can't go on to infect another cell. And so the more difficult way to measure the virus is to actually try to culture it, to make it grow in a plate of cells. This takes a lot of money and a lot of time, uh, and the numbers are very small. And so groups are trying to come up with an intermediate where you say, gosh, if the, the viral DNA looks like it could replicate, maybe that's a pretty good surrogate for its ability to become one of these yellow viruses. So it's tempting to want to use this in a study, but this uh, work by Yachi Ho in 2013 showed us that it's not so easy. So what each of these rice bowls represents is an individual study participant. And the purple is the total amount of total HIV DNA. The yellow is the amount that they would grow. And what I wish this study showed was that the ratio of yellow to purple was consistent across people, meaning that, oh, we can just look at the purple and not have to spend all this money and time looking at the yellow, but you can see that the ratios are not consistent at all. And so what a lot of people have concluded is that if we're just looking at the HIV DNA, which is the cheapest and easiest way to do this, uh, we might not actually be capturing what's going on in, in an actual study participant. The other issue is that if we have an effective therapy, if it takes a million cells, that's a lot of blood, to measure this, and it actually, you know, even this intermediate step here, if we have an effective therapy that's even half good, the yellow is going to go away. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to capture it. The, this viral afrotest assay will become negative, and so we'll be left with just the purple. So this is a big challenge in the field and a big challenge for our particular study. So here's the research question that my group wish, wish to answer, uh, and, and is the basis for a trial, and it's why are these cells so stable over time? Why do they persist? And there are three possible answers. The first answer is that antiretroviral therapy, while extremely good, might not be perfect. So maybe there's some parts of the body that are anatomically sequestered where the drug levels aren't good, the virus does replicate in the cell, and then it enters a new cell, and that cell continues to make more virus and infect other cells. The second is sort of the most boring explanation that maybe the cell just lives for as long as the person, just a long-lived cell. And then the third explanation is that maybe the cell divides and makes copies of itself. In other words, it proliferates. And this is a very attractive hypothesis because if you talk to an immunologist and you ask them what CD4 T cells do in general, they divide. They divide for two reasons. They do this, one, to maintain the total number of T cells so that that level is stable over time. And they do that because they're doing their job. These cells are designed to fight infections of various kinds, be it HIV or be it other viruses. And when they recognize those viruses to help fight the infection, they divide. So this is a known behavior of the cells that get infected with HIV. Now the beauty of this is, is that HIV has given us a little hint as to how we can figure out which of these mechanisms might be happening. So as I mentioned, when HIV replicates, the enzyme, its photocopier that makes copies of itself, is sort of a lousy photocopier. And it induces new mutations every time. And so when a cell gets newly infected with HIV because it's replicating in a cell, the, the DNA of the virus will change a little bit. And we can see that, and we can map that over time. On the other hand, in this case, the virus is just integrated into the host DNA. And the photocopier, in this case, is not the virus replication enzyme, but the human replication enzyme. 
which is an extraordinarily accurate and consistent photocopier, such that the DNA in these two cells will be the same. So if the HIV DNA in these two cells looks the same rather than different, we get a message that this is the, the mechanism sustaining the reservoir. And so why do we even care? The, the reason I would argue that we care is that whichever one of these mechanisms is actually in play would be a great target to try to cure HIV. So if ART is not perfect, then we should try to make it more perfect. We should try to figure out why it's not going to certain parts of the body and develop mechanisms, which I, I won't get into, but better delivery mechanisms to get rid of that last little bit of replication. My personal belief is this is not true, but I, I, I won't get into this, but there are groups studying this. So a lot of the cure therapies that you hear about target longevity. So the idea is if the cell is living in a very stable state, how do I kill this cell more quickly to get rid of the HIV? And this is what latency reactivating agents try to do. They try to get the virus to replicate. And then people are trying to give things like vaccines or immune therapies on top of that to eliminate these cells so that they live a shorter time. Now what's interesting about proliferation is that we have drugs widely used in the clinic, which I'll get to, which actually target this mechanism uh, for different reasons. So we have drugs which are uh, licensed and actually off patent, so very inexpensive drugs which target this particular mechanism. So I would argue that understanding this really helps guide how, how, how you might best uh, involve the reservoir. So I'm just for sake of time, I'm only going to show the evidence of proliferation uh, ra rather than uh, the other two mechanisms, but I'm happy to discuss that after with anyone who's interested. But this is a study uh, by Sarah Palmer from Sydney, Australia, and this is one of many studies, but it's one of my favorites because she examined people on ART who had been on ART for, for quite some time and looked at two time points and also looked at different parts in their body. You can't see the green here, but that's GI, that's blood, and that's lymph node. And despite the fact that these samples were taken at different places and at different times, she saw that there were the same branches on the tree. In other words, the viruses looked the exact same. So that really is very, very indicative of the cells proliferating rather than the virus replicating as the source uh, for these cells. <clears throat> Bob Silicano's group at Hopkins, so whereas Sarah's study looked at the entire rice cup, they managed to do this incredibly difficult work where they just looked at the yellow. So these are just sequences where the virus could replicate. So these are viruses that still work. Uh, and they also saw at different time points uh, the same virus uh, in, in uh, existing, again, indicating cellular proliferation. And the really other incredible thing about the virus and the, the, the papers that nailed this concept down were that every single time the HIV replicates and enters a new cell, it integrates into the human chromosome. But what is absolutely amazing is that it never integrates into the same place mm -hmm. twice. It has all of these different places in our chromosomes where it could integrate, and it integrates into to different places. So if you are able to isolate two cells, and you can see that in those two cells, the virus not only looks the same, but it's also in the same integration site, then you know that cell divided, and it was not a result of the virus replicating. And so this is data from Thor Wagner, uh, who's here in Seattle. And this is a study participant. This is a, a child who is infected with HIV. And this is looking at the reservoir at three different time points after starting ART. So what the colors here mean is that they detected the integration site at least twice. At least twice, meaning that the cell, the source of this had to be a cellular <coughs> proliferation event. Whereas the gray was only once. And so what they concluded when they looked at this, well, at least 30% of the cells, because about 30% of the total, arose from proliferation. And so that's, that's where our group jumped in here. And so this is my group. Uh, we're sort of all well-adjusted nerds. Uh, we do a lot of math. And then Sarah, Thor, and Adam Spivak at Utah uh, really helped us understand this data and explain it to you kind of in the way 
uh, explain it to us and the way I'm trying to explain it to you. And uh, Florian and Martin are my close colleagues at the Hutch. And we all got together and thought about how we, how we could uh, expand upon those results with a bit of math. And the general concept, Dan went to the literature of the wildlife literature, the ecology literature. Uh, and essentially what happens in ecology is, let's say you're a wildlife biologist and you go into the woods and you want to know how many species are there. There's a problem of, of undersampling, where you can only sample a vast, vast, vast minority of what's actually happening in that forest. And so the way we looked at this problem was that the HIV reservoir represents an entire iceberg, but we only have the ability to sample the tip of the iceberg. So we only see the tip of the iceberg. But are there any tools, are there any clever methods that we could use to try to guess what the whole thing looks like? Uh, and so that was the gist of how we went about this. And the analogy I like to use is, so the, these proliferations uh, cells, if you see more than one, uh, you see two, we call them clones. And here's the parallel uh, um, example that I think helps people understand this. So imagine, uh, rather than looking at HIV-infected cells, we're looking at Americans. And in America, there are actually about 100 million people, a little bit less. And let's say you assign those people their clone based on the town they lived in or the city they lived in. The way people look at this data is something called a rank abundance curve, where you take the highest rank and you put that number one, and then you put the number of people in that city on the y-axis, and you just plot it like this. And you'll notice that the axes are so-called log converted, so we're multiplying by 10 as we go up. But the point of this is to show that in the United States, you have big cities like New York and kind of big cities like Seattle uh, that have lots and lots of people. But then you have tons of small towns. I've listed towns that are scenic and fun in the state of Washington and Oregon in our neck of the woods that have very few people, uh, but there are many more of these. And our idea was maybe it's the same with the HIV reservoir, that there are some very big clones and very small clones. But the problem is we're only sampling, when we get a blood draw, a vast minority. We're getting about 100 sequences. So imagine if you could just randomly select 100 Americans, what you would see is you would, you would get some people from New York, maybe you'd get one or two people from Seattle, maybe not, uh, and then you'd get a lot of ones, and some of those ones would be from small cities, some of those ones might be from small towns, but you wouldn't make the assumption that you only had one people person from this town, you'd make the assumption that uh, you were just undersampling. And so what Dan did was he created lots of distributions, so lots of different shapes of what the whole iceberg might look like, and he varied these based on the slope of this distribution, the, doesn't matter, but the, the, this is dying a little bit, as well as the total number of sort of towns in the distribution, and then he just kept on over and over and over using programming, taking 100 samples from these, and then modeling what we like to do is we like it when there is data that are dots and the line goes through the dots. Mm -hmm. And he identified the particular slope here uh, that went through the dots. <laughs> and so then we are able to estimate what the whole reservoir looks like rather than what we're seeing with this tiny little sample. Uh, and, and so the result was very similar to the distribution of towns and cities in the United States. And so we did this both for the big purple cup uh, so using the data from uh, Thor's study, looking at all HIV, and then using the data from the Johns Hopkins study, the ye little yellow cup replication competent virus, so the viruses that actually still work. And the message was the same for both. A small number of very big cities. Uh, amazingly, the largest HIV clones we think have almost 10 million cells in them. So these cells are probably reacting to some other virus and doing their job as an immune cell. And then a massive number of small towns or small clones. Uh, and so the uh, big picture with this uh, is that what we conclude is that when you look at the total population of cells in the reservoir and somebody who's been on antiretroviral therapy for at least one year, the vast majority of these cells were generated by dividing, by proliferating, not by these other two mechanisms. 
I need to really emphasize that we can't rule out these other two mechanisms. So these other two mechanisms might be contributing to a small number of cells in the reservoir, but that we think over at least 98% of cells uh, and maybe more are generated by this mechanism, so this is really a nice target uh, to go after. And so the second piece of the modeling there, I just want to emphasize that math might seem abstract, but there was a, a model put together by Alan Carlson that really helped us decide how to treat people with ART. But this was a complicated model. It had lots of math, it had four equations, but we, uh, Liz and Dan in the group, again with Flory and, and Martin's help, thought, gosh, for the reservoir, it's a lot easier because we don't think the virus is replicating anymore. Uh, and we came up with a model that is actually really, really simple. Uh, for those with any math background, this is, this is the same uh, equation that gives you the compound interest formula, so how your money accumulates sometimes if you, if you deposit it in the bank. Uh, and so, what this model captures is simply what happens to a cell in the reservoir. And here's how I'll, uh, I'll ask you to think about it. So imagine you are a cell in the reservoir. Things can happen to you at a certain rate. And there are three different rates that are uh, important here. The first is the rate at which you divide or proliferate. The second is the rate at which you might die. And the third is the rate at which you become another form of the cell, which is the cell producing HIV uh, and, and replicating. And it turns out that two of these three rates were available from the literature. So immunologists uh, some time ago, using uh, the type of experiment where people in, ingest heavy, safe levels of, of, uh, of a, a type of water that you can document how quickly cells turn over, identified that the cell turns over about once every one to two months uh, in the blood. Alternatively, a cell going from not activated to activated is extremely rare. Uh, so if you're a cell in the reservoir, the probability that you will proliferate in the next month or two is very high. The probability that you will reactivate and produce HIV is actually extremely low. So then what we can do is say, okay, well let's say we have a drug that either influences the rate of reactivation or the rate of proliferation. And so this looks complicated, but it's not too bad. This is uh, something called a heat diagram, and so this is the number of cells remaining in the reservoir. So let's say we start at a million, which is red. Our goal is to get to the colors up here, which are lighter colors. So we want to, our therapy, we want to get from red to blue uh, to get the lowest number of cells possible. And so the way you can imagine these therapies is this is the duration over which the therapy is given. So as we give a particular therapy, we're moving up, 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 and we hope to get into these colors. So we first modeled latency reactivate, reactivating agents, uh, and we thought, let's say we can, over the course of 100 weeks, so two years, increase the rate of reactivation of the virus tenfold. Uh, and if we did that, surprisingly, because that rate is already so low, we don't see much of a budge. But let's say we can decrease the rate of cellular proliferation just like three or fourfold, and do that consistently over a couple of years. We get this enticing prediction that the size of the reservoir might go down uh, substantially. And so uh, this was just a projection, and there are many caveats. So at the Hutch, we, I spent a lot of time with oncologists, and the so as we, I see a lot of uh, people with cancer getting chemotherapy. And the thing with chemotherapy, chemotherapy, just like what I'm about to propose, stops cells from dividing. But what we see you know, in many, many cancers is almost universally a very good effect initially. And the reason is, is that there are certain cells that divide very quickly in a tumor, and those cells get hit right away with chemotherapy, but certain cells that divide very rarely, and those cells stick around. And that's often why chemotherapy doesn't cure people. And so Nicolas Chamont, who some of you might know, had a very important paper about the HIV reservoir, where he said, listen, the reservoir is actually composed of different types of cells. And some of these cells, particularly naive T cells, don't turn over nearly as frequently. And so it's possible that with an anti-proliferative approach, we might get rid of 
effector memory cells and central memory cells, which are more activated and turn over on the scales I mentioned every one to two months. Uh, but more slow cells uh, are, 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 not, uh, are not targeted as frequently simply because the drug has to wait uh, for them to turn over. So th there are uh, caveats with this approach, but we thought it was worth testing. The second piece of the puzzle is, as I mentioned, there, there are drugs, and this is again information uh, that we, we get from collaborating with oncologists. Uh, there's a couple of drugs, but I'll focus on MMF, which is a drug that specifically targets the proliferation of lymphocytes. It's used very commonly in three clinical settings, uh, in, in, uh, in <coughs> patients with rheumatologic diseases uh, to, to limit the need, the need for uh, prednisone. It is used to prevent organ rejection in people who get transplants for lungs or, or kidneys. And we use it at the Hutch uh, quite frequently to prevent graft versus host disease following hematopoietic cell transplantation. Uh, it's actually been given uh, to hundreds of, of persons with HIV because people with HIV are obviously not uh, immune to needing these particular interventions. Uh, but it's an, an immunosuppressive drug. It, it specifically targets proliferation of cells, which are key immune cells. And so in the literature, it has been associated with risks of opportunistic infection. Importantly, most of those risks are when the drug is given with high doses of prednisone, which is often uh, the case in people who have active forms of these disease, but it's definitely worth keeping in mind. The other bummer about this drug is it's teratogenic, meaning, meaning it's harmful to the fetus, and so it really, this really does limit our ability to test this drug in, in women of childbearing age who, who wish to uh, bear children, and that, that's just a fact of, of life, unfortunately, with this drug. And so <clears throat> we then went to the literature and were surprised that somebody had done this already. And we were equally surprised that this was kind of a friend of ours at the Hutch, Oj Shapui, who's an oncologist, and uh, remember this diagram. What Ode did was she gave the drug uh, at the turn of the century uh, in Switzerland for 24 weeks. And so our model predicts a modest, maybe one to two log reduction uh, in the reservoir. Uh, and in three of her six study participants, she saw this. Uh, so this was very interesting old preliminary data. There was a Spanish group that similarly gave MMF and saw a delay in time to rebound. They didn't measure the reservoir. And so there were two very small studies that were uh, somewhat supportive of our hypothesis. And so uh, we applied uh, for funding and, and we're very grateful to receive uh, fund funding from AMFAR to, to, to perform the study. And I really want to highlight Michael's excellent work and the excellent work of our staff at the uh, ACTU at UW, as well as our lab team, which is run by Florian, and Keith has provided great advice uh, to get the study uh, going. And so uh, what we propose is just to give this drug for two years. We, we want to get up to this pink bar, and we're hoping uh, with a high enough potency that we will go beyond this inflection point and get to lower levels uh, of, of the reservoir. So our hypothesis uh, is that prolonged use of this drug will lower the volume of HIV DNA, as well as replication competent DNA. Uh, our inclusion criteria were, uh, uh, I, I won't go into in great detail, but we wanted people who had been fully suppressed for at least a year with a greater nadir than 350. Uh, and so that we focused on the nadir in this particular study. We did not have the resources to have controls, so all of our controls are historical. Uh, very frequent early blood draws to look for low white blood cell counts, which have been seen with this drug, though not commonly. Uh, and we also have a test to see if the drug is actually having an effect in vivo, uh, which Florian's lab helped develop. And this actually is one of our inclusion criteria to make sure that we're observing an anti-proliferative effect uh, and the participants who we enroll. As far as other testing, we have optional GI biopsies. This was not a mandatory component of the study, but for participants who wish to, to contribute uh, these specimens, we opted not to do lymph node biopsies. We do not have an ATI plan. We were putting this together before August of 2018, and we had a lot of discussion about whether this was 
uh, appropriate. I ultimately, I ultimately made the call that I felt that we were too early in this process uh, and that we could reassess if we, if we did see an effective reservoir. Uh, and we are emphasizing very strongly to participants that cure is very, very unlikely and that this is an altruistic endeavor that they are involved in and that they have just been fantastic. And so I have no data to report other than to say we have uh, four uh, participants enrolled. Uh, we had a lot of trouble getting a fifth participant and I'm not sure we will, uh, which is a point of discussion. We have our six month analysis pending and hopefully I'll be able to present this data publicly next year. Uh, and the drug has been well tolerated. Uh, we're using as a primary outcome the big purple bowl and the reason we're doing that is my concern that if we see even a mild effect, the, the yellow will go away, but we're measuring uh, all three. I've mentioned <laughs> the caveats and pros of that approach, and I won't belabor that now, but uh, we're, we have a go no go criteria at one year. If we don't see at least a quarter log reduction in the reservoir at one year, uh, we, that, that participant will stop taking the drug and, and de enroll, and that is applied. Uh, on HIV DNA. Uh, and so uh, I'm a clinician and one of the rules in the hospital when you're uh, by the bedside is that if you're going to order a test on a, on a sick patient, you should know what you're going to do with the results and have a plan. And so uh, we have been thinking a lot about that with this study. Why do the study if you don't have a plan? And so our plans, we have plans for a negative result and plans for a positive result. I'll start with a pessimistic view here. I really want to emphasize that if the study does not work, if we don't see a reduction in the reservoir, I do not think it rejects the hypothesis that cellular proliferation sustains the reservoir. I think that's an important point to make. I think it rejects the hypothesis that the dose we used uh, in this very small cohort of participants was for some reason not adequate. So one option would be poor drug delivery, and so we are giving a low to moderate dose because we were very focused on the safety of these participants, but there are much higher doses given in the clinic for other indications. We're not aware of drug resistance to this drug, but we have this assay where we can look in vivo uh, to see if, if indeed there, there is resistance to the drug. My biggest concern is that we are intervening on a system that ha might have a feedback loop. And so it's possible that by stopping the proliferation of these cells, that there is a cytokine-mediated feedback that then allows them to simply live longer and die less frequently. Uh, and one of the reasons I think that is that when you give MMF to people in general, their total lymphocyte count does not go down. So something is happening to compensate for this. Uh, and then there are issues that are germane to any HIV cure study. Maybe we're not targeting macrophages uh, if there is toxicity, and so we will just have to wait and see. Our plans for a positive result. So I think this would validate our hypothesis or strongly support the hypothesis that sustains the HIV reservoir. And one of the reasons we're excited about this particular uh, drug is that it is widely used, it's off patent, and so our next study, we would like to be in multi-sites multi uh, in North America, but also uh, in Hutch affiliated sites in Africa and Asia, because I, I think this is plausible. Uh, that I, we would not need a ramp up in infrastructure as one might need for, for a cell and gene therapy. Uh, and so, so this is something we're particularly excited about. We have interest in uh, doing these studies in people who may have a smaller <laughs> reservoir as a result of being uh, treated during primary HIV. There's some interest in combination trials. And we're working with the bioengineering department at the University of Washington to try to figure out a way to deliver these cells, this drug, just to CD4 T cells. So we're leaving alone other components of the immune system. We're not targeting B cells. We're not targeting CD8 T cells. And perhaps limit the immunosuppression uh, associated with the drug. The other thing that's exciting is that we know how this drug works. And so one of the ideas that Dan has and he's modeled is modeling different features of the drug. And so we know that different people have different sized reservoirs. We know that different people have different composition of the reservoir. Uh, it looks like people have different potency of the drug. And so 
one idea we've had is that maybe we could dictate the duration of therapy in sort of a personalized medicine fashion based on these observations in, in, in different participants. So this is getting way ahead of ourselves, but it really does help when you understand the mechanism of, of the intervention you propose. Uh, and then finally, there, one of the things we think a lot about in the collaboratory, and we've been working with uh, the other scientists in the collaboratory to model the other interventions, is thinking about combinations. I, I need to say that MMF is not a great team player. Uh, I don't think it will combine very well with a lot of the other promising interventions being considered. Uh, particularly within the cell and gene therapy domain. And so it doesn't mean they can't be given together. It probably means that if both of these are effective but not perfect, rather than being given at the same time, they're, they're, they might need to be given sequentially. Uh, but we're trying to think ahead about this. So uh, my conclusions are that the HIV reservoir is sustained by clonal proliferation of infected cells, much more so than by replication of the virus. Uh, we think anti-proliferative therapy may reduce reservoir volume and may achieve functional cure. Uh, and results from our very small study are coming soon. Uh, I am most grateful to our four study participants who have committed an enormous amount of time uh, to this and, and uh, have really been wonderful in an altruistic sense. Our uh, clinic providers, Lorian's lab, our funders, uh, and and my, the folks in my group who have helped develop this idea. So thanks so much. Mm -hmm. We have time for a few questions before lunch. So I see Bill first, and then we'll get Moses. My comment is more of a statement than it is a question. Uh, as a person living in a uh, you know, when I first contracted it, the New York Times put out an article reporting that the CDC had reported that it would take 10 years to find it a, a cure for AIDS. And now 33 years later, you know, it, back then, when you heard 10 years, at the rate people were dying, we knew we were going to live to see the cure. And, you know, back then it was easy to compartmentalize that and put it on the shelf in the back of your mind. But I know that as, and my, my response to it has always been, logically I can understand the reason. Emotionally, as I get older, I feel my response <coughs> to it is, I feel more defeated every time I think that we're not going to be a cure in my lifetime. And I don't quite know what to do with that because now I'm at an age where I'm wondering what disease am I going to get that's going to take me out. And uh, we've talked about this many times with the CHIV is that people living with AIDS, we know there's not going to be a cure in our lifetime. And my comment has always been that we have to continually come that in because it does affect us at an emotional level. So thank you for your I'll never forget the image of that iceberg that burned me. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. I, yeah, I, uh, just my general response to that is we try uh, to to tone our level of optimism and pessimism appropriately. This is a very hard goal to achieve. Uh, and so I think one needs to have some optimism to survive. Uh, and to continue to do this work, but I, I, I agree. I, I don't think it's, in my view, I'm not willing to put a timeline on any of this as to, as to when we will see the light here. So thank you. Uh, one last one with Moses, and then we'll break. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I have a question we have been discussing. Of the two chromosomes, uh, that is the auto and the sex chromosome, do they both hold the virus? Rebound. And if it is only auto chromosome, is there a possibility of having an intervention which can uh, reverse understand the flow in sequences? 
which can reverse the flow of these chromosomes for suppressed forms. Mm -hmm. There's one group that is looking at ways to keep the virus silent within the chromosome. So rather than eliminate uh, the virus or the cell, simply uh, suppress the virus even more within the chromosome. Uh, I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but that, that to my knowledge is the closest people are coming to try to manipulate the chromosome in some way to suppress the virus. And do both the two types, the two types, the sex one and the older, do they both help in the rebound of the virus? Uh, one type? You know, I'm not sure. I don't, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question about the top of my uh, The virus, I think, rebounds from many different places within the chromosome. Uh, and so that there are certain genes that are probably where, where it lands is a little bit more predictive of whether the virus will rebound uh, or not. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Josh.